Hello and welcome to the second lecture of CS285. Today we're going to talk about supervised learning of behaviors. So let's start with a little bit of terminology and notation. If we have a, a regular supervised learning problem, uh, let's say a computer vision problem, an object recognition problem, we might want to recognize objects in an image. So we might have some input image that goes through a deep neural network and the output is a label. So the terminology we're going to use here is going to be kind of reinforcement learning terminology and I'll gradually work from using reinforcement learning terminology from a, for a standard supervised learning example to then turn that into uh, a reinforcement learning problem. So we're going to call the input O for observation and we're going to call the output A for action. But for now the input is an image and the output is a label. The neural network in the middle or in general, whatever kind of model you might want to have that maps the observations to actions, we're going to call a policy and we'll denote it with the, the letter pi, where the subscript theta represents the parameters of that policy. So in a neural net, theta represents the weights of that neural net. So we have an input O, an output A, and a mapping between them, pi subscript theta, which gives a distribution over A given O. Now, in reinforcement learning, of course, we're concerned with sequential decision-making problems. So all of these inputs and outputs occur at some point in time. So we'll typically use a subscript T to denote the time step at which they happen. Usually in reinforcement learning, we deal with discrete time problems. So we assume that uh, time is broken up into little discrete steps, and T is an integer that represents at which step do you observe O, and at which step do you emit A. So now pi theta gives a distribution over AT, condition on OT. And of course, unlike regular supervised learning, in reinforcement learning, the output at one time step influences the input at the next. So AT has an effect on OT plus one. So if you, for example, fail to recognize the tiger, then at the next time step, you might see uh, something undesirable, like maybe the tiger will be a lot closer to you. So you could extend this basic idea to learn policies for control. So obviously, instead of outputting labels, you would probably output something that looks a lot more like an action, but it could still be a discrete action. It could still use a softmax distribution. So for instance, you could choose from among a discrete set of options upon seeing the tiger. But you could also have a continuous action, in which case pi theta outputs the parameters of some continuous distribution, such as the mean and variance of a multivariate normal or Gaussian distribution. So to summarize the terminology, OT represents the observation, AT represents the action, and then pi subscript theta, AT given OT, is the policy. Now another term that we'll see a lot in reinforcement learning is the state which we'll denote as st. And sometimes we'll see the policy written as at given st. The difference between st and ot is that the state is typically assumed to be a Markovian state, which I'll explain shortly, whereas ot is an observation that results from that state. So most generally, we would write a policy as being conditional on observation, but sometimes we'll write it as being conditional on state and that is a more restrictive special case. So let me explain the distinction between states and observations. Let's say that uh, you observe this scene. There is a cheetah chasing a gazelle. Now, this observation consists of an image, and the image is made of pixels. Those pixels uh, might be sufficient to figure out where the cheetah and the gazelle are, or they might not be. But the image is produced by some underlying physics of some system. And that system has a state, it has a kind of a minimal representation. So the image is the observation OT. The state is the representation of the current configuration of the system, which in this case might be, for instance, the position of the cheetah and the position of the gazelle and maybe their velocities. Now, the observation might be altered in some way so that the full state cannot be inferred exactly. For instance, if a car drives in front of the cheetah and you can't see it, the observation might be insufficient to deduce the state 
But the state hasn't actually changed. The cheetah is still where it was before. It's just that now the image pixels in the observation are not enough to figure out where it is. And that really um, gets at the difference between states and observations. States are the true configuration of the system. An observation is something that results from that state, which may or may not be enough to deduce the state. More formally, we can explain the distinction between states and observations by using the terminology of graphical models. So we can draw a graphical model that represents the relationship between states and actions uh, and observations. As I mentioned, observations result from states. So there's an arrow from S to O at every time step. Your policy uses the observations to choose the action, so that's the arrow from O to A. And the state and action at the current time step determines the state at the next time step. So S1 and A1 go to S2. Now, from inspecting this graphical model, we might conclude that there are certain independencies that are present in the system. So this is the policy pi, this is the transition probabilities, p of st plus 1 given st at, and something we might note here is that p of st plus 1 given st at is independent of st minus 1. So for a state, if you know the current state, then you can figure out the distribution over the next state without any regard for the previous state. That is to say, the future is conditionally independent of the past, given the present. This is a very important independence property, because it says that if you want to make a decision that will impact future uh, states, you do not have to consider how you reach the state you're currently in. It's enough to just consider your current state, and you can forget about previous states that led you to it. This is called the Markov property, and the Markov property is a very, very important property in reinforcement learning and sequential decision making, because without the Markov property, we would not be able to formulate optimal policies without considering entire histories. However, if our policy is conditioned on observations rather than states, as it is in this picture, we could ask, well, are the observations also conditionally independent in this way? Is the current observation entirely sufficient to figure out how to act so as to reach some state in the future? Take a moment to think about this question and consider writing your answer in the comments. The trouble is that the observation is in general not going to satisfy the Markov property, meaning that the current observation might not be enough to fully determine the future without also observing the past. And this is perhaps most obvious from the example with the cheetah. When the car is in front of the cheetah and you cannot see where it is in the image, you might not be able to figure out where it's going to go in the future because you can't see it right now. But if in the previous uh, point in time you could see it, maybe the car was somewhere else before, you could memorize where the cheetah was so that even when it's occluded by the car, you still remember its state. So in general, if you're using observations, past observations can actually give you additional information beyond what you would get from the current observation that would be useful for decision making. Whereas if you directly observe states, then the current state is always going to give you everything you need because it satisfies the Markov property. Now, many reinforcement learning algorithms that we'll discuss in this course will actually require Markovian states, in which case I will write pi of a given s. But in some cases, I will also mention that a particular algorithm could be modified in some way to handle non-Markovian observations, and then I'll describe how that can be done. Now, a little aside on notation. In reinforcement learning, we typically use S to denote state and A to denote action. That's very reasonable because those are the first letters of those words in English. This kind of terminology uh, was uh, you know, widely popularized by the study of dynamic programming, which in many ways was uh, kind of pioneered by Richard Bellman in the 1950s. If you have a background in robotics and optimal control and linear systems, then you might be more familiar with a different uh, notation where X is used to denote state and U is used to denote action. This is exactly equivalent terminology. X makes sense for state because that's usually the variable used for an unknown quantity in algebra and use the first word for action in Russian, which is uh, uh, 
And uh, this makes sense because this kind of terminology was actually popularized by uh, folks like Lev Pantaryagin, who studied optimal control in the uh, Soviet Union. All right, so that's a little bit of terminology, but let's talk now about how we can actually learn policies. And in today's lecture, we'll actually start with a very simple way of learning policies that doesn't even require using very sophisticated reinforcement learning algorithms, but instead learns policies in much the same way that we learn image classifiers and other kinds of models in supervised learning by utilizing data. So let's go to a, a more realistic example. Running away from tigers is maybe not so important in our daily lives, but how about another task, the task of driving? In driving, your observations might consist of images from the car's camera, and your action might consist of how you turn the steering wheel in order to keep the car on the road. So let's uh, kind of take an approach to driving similar to what we might do in, uh, you know, for things like image classification, computer vision, um, and so on. Let's just take some labeled data and use that labeled data to learn a driving policy with supervised learning. So we'll get an image uh, from a person and their corresponding motor commands. So this human driver will have turned the steering wheel in some way and will record what they saw from a camera and will record the steering command. And we'll collect a large data set consisting of image and action tuples. And then we'll simply use supervised learning to learn to map from observations to actions. This is called imitation learning. And this is a particular instance of imitation learning that is sometimes referred to as behavioral cloning. It's called behavioral cloning because, in a sense, we are cloning the behavior of this human demonstrator. The demonstrator is also sometimes referred to as an expert because we assume that they are better at this task than the computer is. All right, so this is a very simple approach, and we could ask the question, well, does it actually work? Um, so this question has, uh, has been studied for a very long time. In fact, the original deep imitation, imitation learning system or neural imitation learning system, something that will be familiar to us today, was proposed all the way back in 1989. It was called ALVIN, the Autonomous Land Vehicle and a Neural Network. And ALVIN did some pretty interesting things. Uh, the network by current standards was tiny. It had five hidden units. Uh, but it could do you know, interesting behaviors like staying on a road. Uh, and uh, there were some attempts to even try to drive it across America. So we could ask, does this uh, basic principle work? Does this behavior cloning principle work? In general, the answer is no. And to give you a little bit of intuition for why behavior cloning might go wrong, even while regular supervised learning would work, uh, let's uh, start with a very kind of abstract picture of a control problem. So. I'll draw a lot of pictures like this in today's lecture. When I draw a picture like this, the, um, the axis on the left represents the state. Now, of course, in general, the state is not one dimensional, but I'll have this axis be one dimensional so that it's easier to visualize. And then the other axis represents time. So this black curve represents a trajectory through time. At every point in time, there's a different value of the state. And let's say that this black trajectory represents our training data. So we're going to take this as our training data, use it to train a policy that goes from S to A, and then we'll run that policy. So now in red, I'm going to draw what this policy will do when we run it. Initially, the policy stays pretty close to the training data because we're going to use a large neural network and we'll train it very well. But it does make some small mistakes. Every learned model will make at least some small mistakes. This is basically inevitable. The trouble is that when this model makes some small mistake, it'll find itself in a state that's just a little bit different than the states that it was trained on. And when it finds itself in a state that is unusual, that is different from the training states, it'll make a bigger mistake because it doesn't quite know what to do there. And as these mistakes compound, the state becomes more and more different and the mistakes get bigger and bigger until after a while, the learned policy might end up doing something very different from the demonstrated behavior. So you could imagine in the car scenario, the car will veer a little to the left, just a tiny bit, then see something unfamiliar and veer to the left a little more until eventually it goes off the road. And we'll see, we'll describe, describe this phenomenon much more formally later on in, in the lecture. But does this work in practice? Well, in practice, actually, sometimes it's pretty effective. So these videos are collected from a, a paper uh, released by NVIDIA in 2016 
And you can see that initially they had a lot of trouble with the system. It would kind of go off the road, do some messy things, run into cones. But uh, after collecting a lot of data and using a few little tricks, they actually ended up with a system that did something fairly sensible that could uh, autom autonomously drive between the cones, stay on the road, and exhibit some you know, fairly reasonable behavior. So why is that? Why is it that we can use behavior cloning methods in practice to train policies that actually do something fairly decent? Well, we'll discuss this in more detail in part two, but uh, one of the things that I want to mention briefly now is the particular technique that was used to address this issue in, in this paper by NVIDIA. So if we look at the paper and we look at the, their description of their system, it mostly looks very much like what we expect. So the, there is a, a convnet, the convnet produces a steering angle, the, uh, you know, the, the car tracks that steering angle, the convnet takes as input, camera inputs, uh, etc. But something that you might notice here is that there's a center camera, left camera, and right camera. What's up with that? Well, it turns out that one of the tricks that was used in this paper, which turns out to be kind of important, is that you record three different camera images at the same time, one pointing forward, one left, and one right. The forward image is supervised with whatever steering angle the person had. The image looking to the left is supervised with a steering angle that is a little bit to the right of what the person did. So that means that if the car saw an image that was going left off the road, it should steer to the right. And correspondingly, the image pointed to the right is supervised with a turn to the left. Now you can imagine how this particular trick in the special case of driving a car would actually mitigate this drifting problem because now these left and right images are essentially teaching the policy how to correct little mistakes. And if it can correct those mistakes, then maybe they won't accumulate as much. Now this is a special case of a more general principle. Uh, the more general principle is that while errors in the trajectory will compound, if you can somehow modify your training data so that your training data illustrates little mistakes and feedbacks to correct those mistakes, then perhaps the policy can learn those feedbacks and stabilize. And there are a number of different ways to do this. Some of them we'll discuss later on in the course. For example, uh, if you train a stable optimal feedback controller around a demonstration and use that feedback controller as supervision, you can actually get stable policies that inherit that stability. Or you can simply ask a person to intentionally make mistakes and correct those mistakes. So there are little tricks like this that we can use to try to patch the issue. But um, something that we could ask uh, also to derive a more general solution is what's the kind of the underlying mathematical principle behind this drift? What's really going on here? Well, when we run the policy, we're sampling from pi theta at given ot. And this distribution, pi theta at given ot, it was trained on some data distribution. And that data distribution, we'll call it p data ot. This is basically the distribution of observations seen in our training data. Now we know from supervised learning theory that when you train a particular model on a particular training distribution and you get good training error and you don't overfit, then you would expect to also get te good test error if test points are drawn from the same distribution. So if we see new observations that come from the same distribution as our training data, even if the observations themselves are not the same, we would expect our learned policy to produce the right action on those observations. However, when we run our policy, the distribution over observations that we actually see is different. The, observation over distri the distribution over observations is different because the policy takes different actions which result in different observations. So after a while, p pi theta ot becomes very different from p data ot. And this is the reason for this compounding error problem. So can we somehow fix this? Can we make p data ot equal to p pi theta ot? If we could do this, then we know that our policy would produce good actions simply from standard results in supervised learning theory. Now, one way to make p data ot equal to p pi theta ot is to simply make the policy perfect. If the policy is perfect and it never makes mistakes, then these distributions will match. But that's, of course, very, very hard. So what if, instead of being clever about our policy, we're actually, we can try to actually be clever about our data distribution? 
So let's maybe not change the policy in some uh, clever way, but let's actually change our data to avoid this distributional shift problem. Now that's the basic idea behind a method called DAGGER. DAGGER stands for data set aggregation. So in DAGGER, our goal is to collect training data that comes from PPI theta OT instead of PData OT. Because if we have observation action tuples from PPI theta OT and we train on those observa observation action tuples, then the distributional shift problem will be gone. So here's how Dagger accomplishes this. We're going to actually run pi theta at given ot, which will produce samples from p pi theta ot, and then we'll request additional labels at those observations. So step one is to initialize our policy by training it on the human data set. Then we're going to run our policy to collect an additional data set of observations that I'm denoting here as d pi, and these observations now come from p pi theta ot. And then we'll ask a human to label all of these observations with optimal actions. So someone will literally watch the observations that the machine produced and tell the machine what the optimal action that they would have taken for those observations actually is. And then we will aggregate, we will actually merge these data sets and then train the policy on it again. Now when we train the policy again on this merged data set, the policy will change, which means that even though our observations in d pi came from p pi theta, now theta is different and p pi theta is also different. So we have to repeat this process. But we can actually show, and this is uh, shown in the paper by Ross et al. that introduced this algorithm, that repeating this process enough times eventually does actually converge, resulting in a final data set that does come from the same distribution as the policy asymptotically. So here's an example of uh, a policy trained with Dagger flying a drone through a forest. Uh, this policy doesn't actually use a deep neural network, it actually uses uh, some linear image features, but subsequent work has done this with deep neural networks as well. So this drone initially was not able to fly through the forest very well, but after a few iterations of soliciting additional labels from the human, uh, it was able to navigate the forest quite proficiently. So what is the issue with Dagger? Why, do, why don't we always use this algorithm in imitation learning? Well, a lot of the issues with Dagger really come from step three. It's a little bit problem dependent, but in many cases, asking a human to manually label d pi with optimal actions can actually be quite onerous. Uh, imagine uh, doing this yourself. Imagine that you're watching a video of a drone flying through a forest, and you have to steer that drone, provide optimal actions, without your actions actually affecting the drone in real time. That's very unnatural to humans because humans don't just map observations to actions in open loop, we actually do feedback control. We watch the effect of our actions and compensate accordingly. And when you can't see the effect of your actions, it can be a little hard to do this. So this is of course situational. In some domains, providing optimal actions for arbitrary observations can be reasonably straightforward, such as in abstract decision-making problems. Uh, like, for example, if you're doing operations research, inventory management, etc., it's easy to ask an expert, you know, if your warehouse is in this state and your prices are this, how should you change the prices? But it's comparatively much harder to ask a human, if you see this image, how should you turn the steering wheel? All right.